I got feeling like I could sing with Brother Harold Welch here for a while. Felt like I just about I'd sing him there, but uh, I'm done in. <laughs> okay, let's take our Bibles now and turn to First Peter chapter number two, and uh, we're going to measure your spirituality. First Peter chapter number two, and uh, we're down to verse number thirteen. So we begin tonight at verse number thirteen, wrap it up at verse number twenty-five. Complete First Peter chapter number two, measuring your spirituality. You ever measure your spirituality? We're going to see about it tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2, now verse number 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto the governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, but when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Bow your heads and let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you now that we can bow before you. Father, we just plead the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, over ourselves, over our spirits, over this church right here. And Father, Lord, we just ask you to give us clean spirits, pure hearts. Lord, we seek you with all of our heart. And Father, Lord, we want what you got for us. And Lord, I pray that you give something to each and every one that's here this evening. Lord, I pray they wouldn't go away bankrupt, Lord. And I pray they wouldn't go away hurting and desiring something from your word, not having received anything from the word of God. But Lord, I believe you got something for us this evening. Lord, I pray that you give each one exactly what they need. And Lord, I pray you make it stick and get it home to the hearts and tie it together, Lord. And I just pray now we go out of this place rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having examined ourselves by the word of God, uh, desiring to do better, coveting in our hearts to do better. And God, I just pray now you might touch our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, now in the passage here in verse number 13, it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, it says, or unto governors, and on a situation goes. And it's a situation thereby where if you're going to find the will of God for your life, you're going to have to be somebody who's a very submissive type of a person. In the Word of God, as far as spirituality is concerned, somebody says, I go to church, I'm spiritual. Well, it's good to go to church. I believe in going to church. I believe in assembling together every time church doors is open, every time it's set up meeting time. I believe you ought to be here. In the Word of God, it says, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together. And it says, as a matter of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And we get together here, we get together for more reasons than one. In the Word of God, in Hebrews chapter number, oh, uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, where the passage speaks about that, right before that, about a verse or two before that, it says, let us provoke one another to love and to good works. And so we get together, and we get together to provoke each other. We get together to pro provoke each other to love, love each other, love the Lord Jesus Christ, love the Word of God, love lost souls, and listen, we, we get together to provoke each other uh, to good works, to live right, to do right, to do what God would have us to do according to the Word of God. So we gather together every time uh, we meet, every time the doors are open, we're supposed to gather together and meet and assemble ourselves together. I believe in that. But you know, I believe there's more spirituality than just that. Some people set up the measuring stick as I go to church. I've been to church. I'm there when the doors open. That's good. I'm glad you're there. That's real good. But listen, friend, there's more to it as far as spirituality is concerned. Somebody says, well, I believe that uh, if you're going to be a spiritual person, I believe in witnessing and winning souls. I believe in witnessing and winning souls too. I believe that's real good. In the Word of God, you're not told to witness. Uh, in the Word of God, you're not told to win some souls. And the Bible says when you do that, the Bible says you're a wise person. And the Bible says you're going to be a rejoicing type of a Christian. That's important. That's real good. But listen, that's not the final mark as far as spirituality is concerned. You know something, my friend, in the Word of God, in the passage right here, there are three things you and I are asked to do that are very hard things to do. And you know, it's, it's uh, something to do a thing that's easy for you and I. It's something to do a thing that's natural. I mean, you come to church, it's natural, it's easy. I mean, you like to come, you like to fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to come to church. I mean, you like to talk for Jesus Christ, you like to witness for the Lord, you like to win souls to Jesus Christ. That's real good, and you appreciate doing that, I appreciate doing that. But you know, sometimes God has to do some things that are not easy to do. In the passage here, these are three things that are very hard things to do, and these things test your spirituality. If you're willing to do things for Jesus Christ it's not easy for you to do, then, my friend, that's a spiritual type of person. Goes on and does them anyhow, not because it's easy. Goes on and does them because they say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, and they do the things that are right, whether easy or not. 
And these things are not uh, easy to do. You take this passage here where it says in verse number 13, it says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. You know what that does? That makes you second best. That doesn't put you up on top. That doesn't make you number one. That makes you number two, my friend. And somebody's ahead of you. And you're the substitute. You're the one to be in subjection. You are the one to be in submission to someone else. In the word of God, that's good. In the word of God in Ephesians chapter number five, it's a general truth among Christians that you and I are supposed to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Somebody tries to help you, listen, my friend, you submit to them. If somebody gives you something from the Word of God that's going to be a blessing to you and a help to you and a strength to you, submit yourself to them. Don't fight it. Don't say, I'm not going to do it. That's just your opinion. Listen, dear friends, submit to them. And the Bible says the general truth is that you and I should submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. In the Bible, of course, there's a general principle, and it goes even further than just a general truth amongst Christians. And that is it's true of some earthly relationships that you and I are supposed to be very submissive people. And you know something? That's very hard to do. Everybody wants to be on top. Everybody wants to be king of the hill. Everybody wants to be number one. And for you to be in submission, in subjection, one of the hardest things you'll ever do is do that. And yet the word of God says you and I are supposed to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. All right, take our Bibles now and go back to Ephesians chapter number five. And we're going to pick up even more than this. We go back to Ephesians five and we'll take another relationship here. And this has to do with husband and wife. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 21. And sometimes it's real hard to do. Sometimes it's hard for a woman to submit to her husband. But according to the word of God, if she's a spiritual woman, she'll be willing to submit to her husband and be in subjection under her husband in everything as long as it doesn't cross the word of God. That's always a final analysis. You don't ever cross the word of God to be in submission to your husband. You don't ever cross the word of God to be in submission to the governor, the king, or anybody else. Listen, dear friend, you go as far as you can go on the right road. Don't take the first turn on the wrong road. But in the passage here, look what it says. In verse number 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one another in the fear of God. Then number 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Then it comes through this way. Uh, in an absolute deadlock, in a situation where you're sure you're right, and he's sure he's right, and you got a situation there where you say, I'm right, and she says, I'm right, and he says, I'm right, and she says, I'm right. Then for the lady there, she submit herself as she would unto the Lord. I mean, if it was just Jesus Christ and you, and you say, I'm right, and he says, I'm right, and you say, I'm right, and he says, I'm right, and just you and the Lord Jesus Christ, then, my friend, what would you do? If you're a spiritual type of woman, you say, Lord Jesus, you're right. You're right, Lord Jesus. You're the one. You're right. And your will fall in, in subjection unto his will. And the Bible says you and I, or especially for the wife there, it says she's to be in subjection. It says uh, to her own husbands as unto the Lord. In an absolute deadlock, you're to submit to them as you would to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. And then in verse number 24, and of course, he's the Savior, but he's not a Savior of your soul, he's the Savior of your body. All right, verse number 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And sometimes, you know, one's married to fellow, he's kind of bullheaded. He's kind of, he's a fellow you can't get through to very easily. He's a fellow you can't do much with. And, and so as a result, if you'll be submissive to him and pray to him, that fellow's going to listen to God better than he's going to listen to you. He'll never listen to you. Listen, that fellow not going to listen to you. And you just be in subjection to him and pray for him. And then that fellow be willing to listen unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the passage there, the Bible says that woman is supposed to be in submission unto her own husband. In the passage there in Ephesians chapter number 6, it doesn't just talk about the women. It talks about the children. And the thing says in verse number 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. It says, For this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first command with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. In the passage there, it says the children are to obey the parents. And you know, there's a lot of children. They obey daddy. They want to obey mama. And mama, she puts the whip on, but mama cannot apply that whip like daddy does. Daddy just has a certain snap to that uh, whip there, and daddy just has a certain crack to that thing, and daddy can just lay that thing on, crap, man, and he can get the job done. But mama, no matter how hard she tries, no matter how loud she screams, uh, no matter how much she goes crazy, she says, you do this, and, and he just doesn't quite seem to do the job. But you know, in the Bible, children, listen, the Bible says you're to obey your parents, not just daddy, not just daddy because daddy can whip harder, not just daddy because you know daddy going to crack that belt on you. Listen, dear friend, you're to, you're to obey your parents, and that includes mama and daddy. And the Bible says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And again, the stipulation is, 
you and I, and of course, everybody's being submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. And children, you obey your parents just like you would the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, honor thy father and thy mother. And you know, here's the thing you got going to the last days. They're not going to be obedient to parents. The Bible says in the last days they're disobedient to parents. And that's the rule of the day. That's the rule of thumb for today. And listen, if you're in obedience to your parents, you'll be an outstanding young Christian boy or girl. And it says, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. And a promise to you is that God's going to take care of you and God's going to get you through perhaps more days than if you did not honor your father and your mother. Uh, in the Bible, back in 1 Peter chapter number 3, it says you're not just going to have long days, but it says uh, a long life. Uh, I like the passage in verse number 10. It says, he that will love life. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 10. He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. So I don't just want to live long, but I want to, I want to enjoy living. I want to love living. I want to love for the sun to come up in the morning. I want to love life. And the Bible says if you do that, there's some stipulations for it. And the Bible says as far as long life, it says, children, it says, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And so, you know, wives, it's hard for you to submit to your husband sometimes. Some conditions, it's very hard for a woman to submit unto her husband. Uh, you take, for example, maybe in a case where, or well, maybe the woman's older than what the husband is. And uh, sometimes it's kind of hard for her to submit. Sometimes she's uh, always had her way, and she's spoiled before the man ever gets her, and she's always been daddy's little favorite. She's always had her way, and so it's hard for her to submit to that man. And yet if she's spiritual in the Word of God, she'll gladly and willingly submit and be in subjection under her own, her own husbands. And the same is true of the children. The Bible says, Obey your parents in the Lord. And then again, of course, it goes even further. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 5, it says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Uh, it says, With fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ. And then it comes on and says some more real good things about it. And in verse number 5, there you have a situation, servant and master uh, situation. In the Word of God, it's never been done away with. In the Word of God, an actual servant-master relationship is scriptural. You find 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You find Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, you find in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. You find it other places in the Word of God. And it's only the civil courts of our country that have done away with it. But of course, just as far as a relationship is concerned, the Bible says they are to be obedient to their masters. And the Bible says you and I are servants to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he's our master. And so those are the rules that are set up for you and I, everybody in general, in submission unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as far as Christians are concerned, in 1 Peter chapter number 2, uh, the Bible says you and I were supposed to be in subjection and in submission unto the rulers. How far do we go? Well, we go as far as you do in a husband and wife relationship. Uh, we, do, we go as far as you go in a uh, children-parents relationship. We go as far as you go in a servant-master relationship. You never cross the word of God to obey anybody. I don't care whether the king, I don't care if the governor, doesn't make any difference who they are. You never cross God and his word. Illustration, Exodus chapter number 1. Exodus chapter number 1, the story of the midwives. Pharaoh says, kill them, kill those little baby boys. Get rid of them, kill them all. And those midwives, the Bible says, they feared God. And in so doing, they decide they'd take another route. They would not kill the little children. And the Bible says that God blessed them for it. Exodus chapter 1, verse number 15. Exodus chapter 1, verse number 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Puah. And he said, What when ye do the office of midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools? If it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing? And have saved the men children alive. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives coming unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And so in the passage you can understand, you go as far as you can go without crossing God and his word. In the passage there they would not cross the word of God. They would not go against God and his word, and God blessed them for it, even though they went against the king. You take the situation by the roll off, God. I mean, you say, how come he doesn't obey the powers that are ordained of God? Well, listen, dear friends, sometimes you just don't obey them when they go against the word of God. You stand for God, you stand for the word of God, and you keep on riding the ship out, and God eventually is going to bless somebody just exactly like he did the midwives back in Egypt in the days of old. So submission is the rule as far as the word of God is concerned. Like I said, for some it's very hard. 
I mean, for wives, there are certain kind of men. It's hard to be in subjection unto them. I mean, you feel like you're smarter than what they are. <laughs> Maybe you are. Some cases, perhaps you are. I believe I know cases where that woman is smarter than the man. Not at my house now, but I mean, other places. <laughs> I've seen it where they're smarter than what the man is. And there are other reasons why sometimes a woman has a hard time being in subjection to that man. But according to the Word of God, if you have any spirituality you at all, you gladly submit to them and be in subjection unto them as long as they do not ask you to cross God in His Word. And when they ask you to cross God in His Word, then you never need to worry about being in subjection on them. You be in subjection, number one, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes you take a child, he's got a daddy that his daddy doesn't, uh, has never really uh, put anything upon him. His daddy has never taken and broken his spirit. His daddy has never showed him where authority comes from. And listen, if you don't learn to obey your earthly father and he doesn't teach you to obey him, you'll never obey your heavenly father and take the grace of God to get you through. But that daddy hasn't done that. In some cases, they don't even have a daddy. And so as a result, they've got to go just by the word of God. And the word of God says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Again, servants, and of course, the United States of America, we got laws and, and television being what it is. Everybody's seen that type of thing. Uh, nobody anymore believes in being servants, but you and I, according to the passage here, you and I are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number, oh, verse number 16, the Bible says, you and I are as the servants of God. We're servants of God, and then the servant-master relationship, that's the very good thing for you and I to take heed unto. And of course, the Christians, I mean, the, the rulers are hard to obey. I mean, you stop and think about the rulers of our land and, I mean, corruption on every hand. I mean, the politicians, they are corrupt. And you say, uh, uh, do you vote? Well, uh, I should vote, and I'm registered to vote. Are you going to vote? I don't know if I'm going to vote. Why aren't you going to vote? Who am I going to vote for? <laughs> I mean, they all say they're born again. Jimmy Carter said they're born again. Anderson claims they're born again. Reagan claims they're born again. I mean, if they don't do any better than Carter did, man, I ain't got nobody to vote for. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? I said, it's kind of a hard situation. And yet, by the same token, if you don't vote, you don't have any uh, argument coming. Whenever they say this is the way it's going to be and set up some laws of no good, if you don't vote, you don't have any argument coming. And so it's kind of a tough situation. But in the Word of God, you and I, if we have any spirituality whatsoever to us, then according to the Word of God, you and I be submissive uh, to the kings, to the governors, and every ordinance of man, uh, the Bible says, uh, for the Lord's sake. All right, verse number 14, O unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers. That's supposed to be true, according to Timothy also. I mean, law is set up for the evildoers, the lawbreaker, but it's kind of been reversed these days. And it says, uh, for the praise of them that do well. And, of course, again, that is, uh, that's been reversed. I'll never forget when I first began preaching on the street corner down there. Policemen, they used to stop us every week. I mean, it's just about a routine thing. You kind of the fact that five minutes after you start preaching, the policemen come down through there. I got so popular down there, man, there's three or four of them wanted to come down and shake my hand. <laughs> uh, well, it wasn't the policemen, though. They come down there, and the Christians come by, and some of those, uh, you know, sometimes people think that I don't like Pentecostal folks, and I appreciate some Pentecostal folks. I'm not Pentecostal. I mean, I'm a Baptist preacher, and, uh, but I don't, uh, I'll tell you what, I've seen situations down there, and those old policemen come up there, and they'd call me over to the side of these Pentecostal ladies, they'd walk by and say, God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. Praise the Lord, brother. You know, and stuff like that. I appreciate that. And uh, some of those situations, it's kind of hard, you know. And, and uh, I mean, they say you can't preach. And you know you should preach. And you know it's right for you to preach. And they say, but you can't preach. And if you don't get a license, you're not going to be able to preach. And you get a license, they take the license from you. They still try to stop you. And they say, I'm sure you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> well, that's all right. got to come down and find out. And uh, you know what one of my friends did? One of my friends said to him, very, very wise deduction. He said, look. He said, what you guys stopping that preacher man for? He said, he ain't doing nothing but preaching the word of God. He said, you want to arrest somebody? Go on down Cherry Avenue. They're gambling right out in the street corner. Right out in the sidewalks. They're gambling. You want to arrest somebody? Go down there and do it. <laughs> and he never bothered me after that. I appreciate that. That's pretty good thinking, isn't it? I mean, if you want to arrest somebody, if you've got to get, uh, you know, a little uh, something going for yourself there and get a little status quo going, go down there and arrest those guys gambling on the sidewalks. Why arrest a man for doing well? I mean, not doing anything but preaching the word of God. Just in simplicity and sincerity, just for all I'm worth, standing up there and saying, ye must be born again. <laughs> but you know something? Uh, these days, things are sort of twisted. So we go as far as we can, and we obey them. We submit to them as far as we can. And the Bible says it's the will of God. In the Bible, if you want to know the will of God, uh, the Bible says, well, it says, uh, holy living is the will of God in First Thessalonians chapter 4. It says being thankful, that's the will of God, First Thessalonians chapter number 5. And the passage here, you cannot miss as far as the will of God's concerned, as far as submission's concerned, there are certain situations in your life, lady, wife, children, and Christians in general, there are certain situations in which you and I are to be submissive. 
In verse number 16, it says, As free and not using your liberty. It says, For a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. In Galatians chapter 5, the Bible says, You and I are supposed to stand fast in the liberty we have in Jesus Christ. But it says you've got to be very careful that you don't use that thing as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And so God wants you and I to stand fast in the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus, but God doesn't want us to use that liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, and God doesn't want us to use it as an occasion to the flesh. God wants us to use it as the servants of His and use it to glorify Him. In verse 17 it says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. I mean just short and sweet. Fear God, love them, and you know when the Bible says, Let brother love continue. And you and I, we need to love each other. We need to pray one for another. We need to care one for another. We need to demonstrate our love for another. We need to, if, if need be, even to lay down our lives for the sake of another. It says, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, servants, it says, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Then verse number 19, another way you test your spirituality is not just whether or not you're willing to be submissive. Perhaps you are. Here's another way that's real hard to do, and Ladies, I realize it's very, very hard for you to be submissive to your husbands. Children, I realize in the day and age in which we live, it's very, very hard for you to be obedient to your parents. Uh, listen, dear friend, I realize, Christians, it's hard to be in submission, submission and submissive to a, a government that's corrupt. It's very hard to do. But go as far as you can, as, they don't, as long as they don't ever ask you to cross God and His Word. Go as far as what you can. Hard to do, but do it anyhow. All right, now another thing that's real hard to test your spirituality uh, begins at verse number 19. This has to do with suffering. The first has to do with being submissive and subjection. And the second has to do with suffering. In verse number 19, it says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Uh, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well, you suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. And it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that she should follow in his steps. And you and I need to be very careful, and, and because of our conscience towards God, we go on and keep on doing right, and we endure grief, and sometimes you take it on the chin for doing right, but you're willing to do it, and even though the suffering you're called to go through, uh, I mean, it's not something you deserve, it's not anything that uh, rightfully should come your way, according to the Word of God, you suffer wrongfully, and the Bible says because your conscience towards God, you just keep on doing right, and keep on doing right, and keep on doing right, and you're willing to take it on the chin, take it in the back of the neck, take it in the back, you're willing to take it day after day, and suffer wrongfully because you will not cross God and His Word. Take your Bible, go to Acts chapter number 24, and you find Paul how uh, much he was concerned about a good conscience. Acts chapter 24 and verse number 16. Acts 24, verse 16, he says, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. He's concerned about having a good conscience. This good conscience uh, is, shows up in his speech. For example, he was very polite in verse number 10. Then Paul, after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know, that thou hast been a many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. He was a very polite man. He had a good conscience towards God and towards man. And that thing showed up because he was polite. That thing showed up in the very fact that he answered very cheerfully. He wasn't down at the mouth. He wasn't aggravated. He wasn't tore up about some things. But he says, I answer the more cheerfully for myself. In verse number 11, he also answered very carefully. Because if thou mayest understand, there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. In plainer words, he says, King, I know you realize all the charges they brought against me. I've only been up there 12 days. There hasn't even been enough time for me to commit all the things they say I'm guilty of. And you know that, King, and I'm glad to be able to stand before you today. And Paul had a good conscience towards him. In verse number 12, he says, And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. In plainer words, he wasn't an argumentative type of a person. His conscience was clean. His conscience was clear. It says, Neither can they prove the things where they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. And goes on talking about the resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. And so there's always the emphasis on a good conscience. Uh, you take, for example, Paul writes to a young preacher man. He writes to Timothy. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 5. And 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 19. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 5. 
Verse number five, the Bible says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Talking about a good conscience once again. In verse number 19, he says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And he names Hymenaeus and Alexander. And he says they've been delivered unto Satan. And of course, the Bible says, Later on for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so you and I, listen, sometimes we've got to suffer. And sometimes we keep our conscience clear. We keep our uh, conscience uh, clean. And we keep on suffering, though we're suffering wrongfully. We're not going to cross what God has taught us in his word. And what the Holy Ghost of God has put upon us, we wouldn't cross it for anything in this world. And we go on and we suffer wrongfully. Again, the Bible uh, situation there, it says you suffer for well-doing. I mean, we can understand somebody suffering for doing wrong. We can understand somebody suffering for not doing right. I mean, it's hard to imagine somebody taking on a chin for doing right. And the Bible says, what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently, it says this is acceptable to God. And so you and I have got to be very careful to distinguish between our own stupidity and really doing what God told us to do and then taking it for doing exactly what God has told us to do. Somebody says, oh, Brother Martin, I don't like to suffer. Oh, Brother Martin, I don't like to be put through it. Oh, Brother Martin, I really can't hardly take it going through it. Like old Bob Jones Sr. said one time, beats hell, doesn't it? It sure does. And whenever you get called upon to go through something, you suffer and you say, I don't deserve it. Well, the Bible says if you take it, and if you take it patiently, it says this is acceptable with God. All right, so then we're very careful about our conscience. We're very careful whenever we suffer for doing right. And yet the suffering still comes our way. And we examine ourselves. We're not trying to be big... Uh, people not trying to be uh, tough people and yet still the problems come our way and the suffering still comes our way and the Bible says if under those conditions if you simply have done nothing wrong and you've done right and the suffering comes in then take it patiently and wait for deliverance from God and the Bible says you do well for it again verse number 21 the Bible says in relation to suffering it says that you and I are called thereunto. look at verse number 21 for even hereunto were ye called and every Christian is called to do some suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be thankful that you haven't had a calling like Paul's had. Uh, Paul had a calling there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Uh, you get reading about everything he went through. I mean, 24, 25, 26. Uh, that fellow was beaten with rods. That fellow was in the, in the uh, deep a night and a day. Uh, uh, Paul was beaten uh, over and over again. Stoned, left for dead at Lystra. Uh, various things of that nature. And Paul's ministry was that of suffering. He says, I'm going to show you how great things you must suffer for my name's sake. And you and I can be so very thankful that even though we're called to suffering, we're not called to suffer exactly like Paul did. And if you go through it, my friend, just think of the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible gives that in the verses that follow. So spirituality is measured by whether or not, uh, even with a good conscience, you still suffer. And you suffer wrongfully. You keep on doing what God tells you to do in his word. That's a spiritual person. And you're very careful. You're not trying to bring trouble your way. You're not trying to cause aggravation. You're not trying to uh, bring some trouble towards your uh, angle. But it still comes in towards you. And you suffer for doing well. And you keep on taking it and doing right. The Bible says when you do that patiently, you do well. You do right. Again, that's very good. And that's a tremendous measure of spirituality. And then also when a person's willing to suffer simply because they are witnessing for the Lord or they are an example of a witness for the Lord, then, my friend, that's very good, a very good measure of spirituality. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, he did no sin. Yet look what the Bible says. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he, was, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. All right, then the Lord Jesus Christ gives us an example to follow of suffering, even though he did no wrong. I mean, he did not even do any sin. He, it was no deceit, no guile found the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus Christ took our sins in his own body on the tree. And the Bible says that's an example for you and I to follow. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was threatened, the Bible says he threatened not again. Threatened not. The Bible says, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And so that's an example of the suffering that you and I should take. And sometimes you'll suffer. People say things about you. You haven't done anything wrong. They'll pick or they'll nitpick. Uh, sometimes you haven't done anything wrong at all. 
And still they come out and they say this about you, something else about you. And so doing, if you'll keep on taking it and take it patiently according to the Word of God, then that's a tremendous measure of your spirituality. One time I worked with a fellow. And this fellow, he was, he was just a young man about 19 years of age. And I'll never forget the crew that I was on those days. Back in those days, I wasn't even saved. And, and he used to make fun of this guy. He was saved and witnessed for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he used to make fun of him. And, and, you know, he kept on living for Jesus Christ just day after day after day. And there were some things that fellow took. I mean, uh, uh, he didn't do anything wrong. And yet they would seem to always pick on him, always mock him, always make fun of him. And I think of that fellow to this day. I could not forget that fellow. I mean, there was a young man that did no wrong. And I mean, the next year the boss man says, Ain't no sense getting a guy like that even back around this crew. I mean, that fellow lost his... and trust God and don't revile again don't threaten again just go on trusting God just exactly like the Lord Jesus Christ did tremendous measure of your spirituality one more thing and that has to do with supplying number one submitting number two suffering number three supplying verse number 25 24 and 25 it says for you were as uh, 25 you were as sheep going astray but now I return of the shepherd and bishop of your souls and a shepherd of course he's somebody that needs to care for the sheep he needs to be very careful about the sheep there that they get the food they need. He needs to be very careful about their safety. Uh, the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the shepherd and bishop of your souls. There's no problem with the Lord Jesus Christ supplying exactly what you have need of. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's called the great shepherd in the word of God. They make you perfect and establish in every good word. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's called the sheep, chief shepherd in the word of God. He's able to give you a crown for doing right and for feeding the sheep. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is called the good shepherd in John chapter number 10. He's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. There's no problem about the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he says, my sheep, he says, I'm the door. And he says, if any, uh, he says, they uh, come by me, he says, they get saved, shall go in and out and find pasture. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ make you lie down in green pastures. The Lord Jesus Christ knows exactly where the food's at. Jesus Christ is able to feed you. That's no problem. The problem comes in with you and I. And the problem comes in with Brother Art Martin. He's got some sheep he's got to feed. And I'm not the shepherd as the Lord Jesus Christ is in the passage here. But I'm a shepherd under him. I'm an under shepherd. And likewise, you husbands, uh, you've got responsibility as far as your wives are concerned. Have you seen that they've got the spiritual food that they need? Are they being nourished spiritually from the Word of God? Are they getting what they need from the Word of God? And you, my friend, are responsible for your family. I'm responsible for this uh, bunch of Christians right here. And that's where the problem lies. In the Word of God, it says he called David from following the uh, from the sheep coats and says, "Go on and feed my flock." And in the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Bible says he he was careful about their safety as well as their food. He says there's somebody out there waiting to break in and get hold of the sheep. The, the thief is waiting to steal and to kill and to destroy. In the Word of God, in Acts chapter twenty, the Bible says the wolves are there and they're waiting to get in and destroy the flock. And you and I need to be very careful that we don't let anybody get destroyed if your husband here you've got to guard your wife as far as her spiritual condition is concerned be careful that nobody destroys uh, that lady be careful about your children be careful that you provide for your own house and make sure they get the spiritual food that they need you know in the bible the bible speaks about especially uh, the shepherd doing some feeding take your bible and go to second corinthians look at chapter number nine. Second corinthians in chapter number nine verse number ten 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 10. It says, Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. In plainer words, in a situation whereby you get fed, then the statement is, you don't just get fed, but you've got bread, and you've got food to give to somebody else, and in so doing and giving food to somebody else, the statement is you then increase your fruits of righteousness. I mean, if you never put it out, there's not going to be any fruit. And so it's up to the under shepherd to feed the sheep and lay it on them and put it on them so they've got something to say when they go out and witness. How'd you like to go out and witness, Sam? No more than John three sixteen all your life. I mean, you couldn't go very long. You couldn't hardly even go from your angle and witness with no more than that. But I'll tell you, friend, when you've got a whole Bible, 
You got the Word of God, man, I mean, you can give them something from John, you can give them something from Romans, you can give them something from the book of Acts, you can handle anything in the Word of God. I mean, you can go because you've got some food for them. Or as I pass the food on to you, then you pass it on to other, and the result is, of course, uh, that your fruit is increased. Illustration. Joyce Groom, for example, she had a Bible, she didn't realize what she had. I mean, I feel sorry for some of these people that are being sold down the river. Uh, hers was the second case I heard from the same situation. And Joyce was sitting there, and Brother Earl Miller had to look over and say, Oh, you got a Schofield Bible. And he said, Oh, no, a new Schofield. And Joyce never even knew the difference. She did not know the difference. And he says, Get Dr. Ruckman's books. She got Dr. Ruckman's books. She was at my doorstep last Monday morning. And I was going out making hospital calls. I was here and there and yonder. And I was down with my mother in law. My mother in law's and her and I was running competition. See, you could not talk each other. And she won. <laughs> like ladies always do, she won. <laughs> and she was talking my leg off. And I went to dial the phone to call home. And oh, yeah, I was supposed to tell you that you're supposed to call home when you got here <laughs> half hour later. You know, so I called home. And then I couldn't get out the door. She just, she was talking my leg off. <laughs> I'll get her in the car tomorrow and take her for a ride and just let her talk as long as she wants to. <laughs> but anyhow, she's not as weak as what you might consider her to be. She can do some talking. Talk, and I mean, she'll bend your ear, <laughs> but she's going to talk about good things. Now she'll talk to you about the Lord. Well, anyhow, uh, Joyce was there for about an hour and a half waiting on me, and I didn't get home, so she finally left. I got over there, and Shirley says, Joyce was there. Here's her Bible. She got a new Schofield Bible, and she wants something on it. So I got some notes in the middle of my Bible there. And I took and jotted them down a piece of paper and, and uh, put them inside her Bible and wrote a couple notes in there. And she said, you're not writing her Bible, are you? Said, sure I am. <laughs> and I wrote uh, a couple places in her Bible there and gave her Bible back to her. And you know what she did? She went out this past week and spent $31 to buy an old Schofield Bible. Amen. And she got talking lady over there, Christian book, uh, Berean. She got talking lady over there, and the lady over there says, uh, well, I don't know anything about that. What about that stuff? And she come in this morning, she says, you got anything I can give to her? And so as I give something to Joyce, she passes it on to her, and then Joyce's fruits of righteousness are increased. But if I don't have anything to give to Joyce, she don't have anything to give to her, and ain't nothing happens. See? That's illustration. Patty calls me up this afternoon, and she said, Brother Art, <laughs> it says, uh, am I interfering with something? I was trying to listen to that tape, Miss Modox, and get it, you know, back and forth. She, I, apparently I am, so that's okay. I turned it off. And she says, I just got done talking to a couple of JWs, and she got talking to them, and she says, well, what do I do about 1 Corinthians chapter 15? She began to ask me about this and ask me about that. And as we got talking about certain things, I gave her some answers. And I said, she said, do you have any tracks on us? Well, I don't have any tracks on I've given them away. Joyce was witnessing one time, and I gave her a bunch of stuff. But I said, I got some notes in my Bible. I took off a track one time. She says, read them to me. So I took my Bible, and I flipped the thing back there and found the notes there. Jehovah Witnesses refuted. And so I began one by one. I think I listed about seven, eight, nine things there in which we refuted their teaching by the Word of God. And I passed some food on to her. Next time the JWs come around her door, she's going to pass something on to them. And if they're honest, which they probably aren't, if they're honest, they're going to be an increase of fruits of righteousness. That's the idea. And so as the under-shepherd, that's my responsibility. We know Jesus Christ has it. We know where it's at. We know he's got all that we need. As the under-shepherd, I'm responsible to feed my people so they've got something to say wherever they go. Take your Bible and go to Zechariah chapter number 11. As a matter of fact, stay there for a minute. Look at verse number 11 and 12. It says, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. In plainer words, that's exactly what the saints want. That Bible says that thing is, uh, it supplieth the want of the saints. And you and I are responsible, whatever we got before us, we're responsible to supply the food that is the want of the saints. They're not going to have anything to pass on if we don't supply the food for them. Zechariah chapter number 11. Zechariah 11 and verse numbers. Uh, let's see here. Zechariah 11 verse number 9. Zechariah in the Old Testament. Now chapter 11 verse number 9. Willie, you got it? Okay, amen. Zechariah 11 9. Then said, I will not feed you that that the dieth, let it die. That that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. Now this thing is true in a spiritual sense also. It's a situation here where God's people do not get fed. I'm not going to feed you. You're going to die. Go on and die. And the Bible says there in relation to it, let the rest eat everyone, the flesh of another in a spiritual sense. If you don't feed them the word of God, they're going to be picking on each other. They're going to be backbiting as far as each other's concerned. They're going to be gossiping as far as each other's concerned. I mean, listen, wouldn't you rather have them like that thing says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9? It says, it causes thanksgiving unto God. 
and says is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. And I would much rather feed my people and give them everything I can give them and then give some guys to give more than what I can give them and just load them down with the word of God so that they're praising God and thanking God instead of fooling around and picking on somebody and backbiting and say, you got this problem, this is your problem, and just picking each other apart. Take your Bible now and go to Jeremiah chapter number 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Here's the condemnation. I talk, first of all, mainly to the women. I talk, uh, secondly, I talk to every Christian as far as suffering is concerned. Thirdly, I talk mainly to myself and Sunday school teachers. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, and to husbands. It says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Why are they scattered? What causes a sheep to go astray? What causes sheep to be scattered or sheep upon the hillside? What causes it? Here it is. It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my fl uh, flock and driven them away, have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil you are doing, saith the Lord. Well, he says he fed them there. But look at 3 and 4. It says, I will gather remnant in my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. In plainer words, it's apparent that the pastors that were feeding them left the people in fear, left the people dismayed, left the people lacking, and did not get the food they needed. And so God says, Woe be unto you, pastors that scatter my sheep. And so the condemnation is if there's any spirituality, uh, then the pastor needs to put it out. That's what the saints want. It causes thanksgiving. It keeps them from scattering. It keeps them from backbiting. It's exactly what they want. And Jeremiah chapter 23 condemns the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, that will not feed those that God has given unto him. Now, there's no problem with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know he'll give you all you need. The problem lies in somebody like myself. The problem lies in Sunday school teachers. And dear friends, let me say to you, God, take it in before you can put it out. The problem lies in husbands. Is your wife nourished? Are you providing for your own house? Are you making sure your wife is getting the food that she needs? And there's an extent which you control and make sure that she gets what she needs. Uh, example, there's a fellow used to come around this church named Brother Rich Kipp. And Brother Kip, when he first came to this church, was the first young man that ever came and stuck. First young married couple, Rich and Dan's the first couple that ever came and stuck as far as this church is concerned. Back in those days, meeting down in the basement of my house. And I can understand why they, uh, others would come and would not stay. But Rich came and he liked what he heard. And Rich began to keep on coming. And his wife did not desire to come. She thought, we'll just go off somewhere else. And Rich said, no, I like what I'm hearing. I like what I'm getting. I've learned some Bible. And Rich just kept the issue, uh, uh, kept that thing before her. And uh, as a result, kept her coming around the Word of God. And tonight you have one of the finest Christian women you'll ever be in Jan Kip. You know why? Because Rich saw that she was nourished. And he saw that she got what she needed. Whether she wanted or not, he kept her under the word of God. And she kept on coming. And she got her heart dealt with. And eventually, uh, God broke her spirit. And I'll tell you what, she's wept before God. If you saw her last summer when she came home, she didn't even want to go back to Florida. I mean, she left and they bawled both of them, bawled like babies. And they took off from Bible Believers Baptist Church. But when she came in, it was Rich, the one that had the spirituality. And Rich was the one that saw that his wife got nourished and knew if God's ever going to do anything, I've got to keep her around where God can do something. And God did. And therein the problem lies. And you and I have got to be very careful. We've got to be very careful that we give them all that we possibly can and see that we're nourished. Take your Bibles and go to Psalm 78 now. I'm just about ready to wrap it up. Verse 70 and 72. Psalm 78, verse number 70. He chose David also his servant and took him from following his sheep folds. From following the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. All right, then, if you're a husband here today, if you're a Sunday school teacher here today, and to myself also, I understand according to the word of God, even for a teacher, your heart is as important as your head. You can have everything right. You can say this verse compares with this verse. This verse compares with this verse. You run this uh, section of verses here. You get this. You come out this way. You can have everything right. But according to the word of God, he says you guide them. Uh, feed them with the integrity of your heart. 
not just the brains in your head. Listen, dear friend, the integrity of your heart. And it's absolutely essential that you keep your heart clean and pure before God. It's as important and important as anything uh, as far as the Word of God's concerned. He fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with the skillfulness of his hands. And if you've been saved a while, you can stop and think, what hurt me when I first got saved? Then you guide them and steer them around what hurts you. You say, where did I get off the track? I got off the track over here. The Bible says you didn't run well. I said, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You say, somebody over here steered me wrong. And you can guard them and say, looky here, be careful over here. Be very careful. Someone is waiting for you. There's a hyper dispensationalist out here waiting for you. There's a Campbellite out here waiting for you. There's somebody out here waiting for you. And you be very careful where you got off. Make sure they don't get off. How you got off. When you got off. Where you got off. And do your very best to save them from something that caused heartache to you in your Christian life. So you guide them. You feed them with the integrity of your heart and with the skillfulness of your hands. Spirituality. You get measure in the things. Uh, do you desire it? I desire it. I'm sure you do too. How do you measure it? Submission, subjection. Wives, what about it? Would you say you're spiritual? What about it? Who rules the roost? Let me take my glasses off so I can see you. What about it, women? Huh? What about it? Any spirituality to you? What about it? You measure. You say I'm more spiritual than what she is. No. Bible says you don't measure yourself among yourselves. That's not wise. You don't worry about anybody else. You measure yourself by the Word of God. Yeah. In the Word of God, I mean the general rules, Christians, you submit yourselves to one another, but wives to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Yeah. What about it? Measure. You don't have to answer now. Answer before the Lord. Measure. All right. What about suffering? Christians, how about it? Do you suffer wrongfully? you suffer for well-doing? you suffer for being a witness and example of the Lord Jesus Christ? Every Christian, are you willing to suffer that way? Say, Brother Martin, you know, I desire to be called. But nobody desires that calling, do they? The Bible says, even hereunto, you're called. You're called to suffer. That's par for the course. When you take it on a chin, that's par for the course. Are you willing? What about it? Measure yourself. Not among yourselves, but the Word of God. A little bit of suffering. Can you take it? Will you take it? Will you take it when you haven't done nothing wrong? Are you going to threaten? Are you going to revile? I'll say, I'm going to get you. I'll get even with you. Last thing I ever do, I'm going to get even with you. Just wait. Just give me a chance. I'll get you. I'll get you. Or are you just going to commit yourself to the Lord who judges righteously and say, Lord, I know that eventually uh, you execute righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. What about it? And then supplying physical and spiritual food. Husbands and dads, what about it? Have you seen that your wife has had what she needs from the Word of God? You don't realize I've got to give my wife more than what even I preach right here. You realize there's times because of certain situations that arise in the house that I just got to take the Word of God and open the Word of God and we sit down and read the Bible at supper time and I just got to read a certain passage in the Word of God because that's what's needed. What about you? Have you seen your wife get something? You care about her? Not just physically. I mean, that's important. What about spiritually? What about your children? Are you concerned about what they're getting? Are you concerned about it? You should be. You should be. Are you supplying the want of the saints? They desire. Give them more. Give them more. You give them something more, they get. Old Earl, he sits there. All right, all right. Right after the shop, he goes more and starts putting it out. Say, and you got to give them something. Got to give them something. You know, as I close this lesson, I've seen a lot of people that. You just about think that they just miss Holy Spirit. No kidding. I mean, you get around to those parties and no kidding. You just about think that they were miss Holy Spirit themselves. I've seen them. I've seen them. I've seen fellows that you just about think that you get around them, they're Mr. Holy Spirit. 
junior son. You would. To hear them talk and get around them, but you know, if you get measured by the word of God, they fall woefully short. And according to God's standard of measurement, where would you classify yourself? Take a scale of zero to hundred. Where would you classify yourself? Wives? How do you fare? Christians? What about suffering? You want to take some reproach? He did, didn't he? Didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do one thing wrong. You have. He didn't do anything wrong. He ever. He did. He took it. He took it. He took it patiently. That is the land of the slaughter never opened his mouth. Are you willing to take it? Husbands. Sunday school teachers, pastors, <clears throat> what about it? Are you supplying the want of the saints? Are you giving them something? Are you doing your best to give them something from the Word of God? How do you come out? How do you come out? One time, I remember Dr. Ruffin telling a story of a young lady in the camp and he had a situation, he said, Grade yourself. And she's probably one of the most spiritual ladies in the young ladies in the in the youth camp. And he asked her afterwards, he said, Ruth Ann, he said, How'd you how'd you come out in that test? Where'd you grade yourself? She says, Oh, Brother Ruffin said I couldn't give myself anything. I don't know what you've given yourself in this scale here. Gazing your spirituality, I wouldn't know what you gave yourself. I'll put it this way. I bet there's room to improve. I bet you wives could improve. I bet you Christians could take more than you think you can take. I bet you children, I bet you could improve. You husbands, I know you can improve. Sunday school teachers, I'll bet you could even do better. Yeah. Brother Martin, I know can do better. What we're going to do about it? We're going to sit around and say, oh, we had a big meeting about two weeks ago. Look at our baptistry, man. We really got something going. I'm going to say, God, we need some help. Amen. According to your book, we got some problems. According to the book, according to your standard of measurement, Lord, you've just been real good to us and we didn't deserve it. Amen. Lord, you've just been real, real good. God, give me some grace. I'm going to do better. Amen. If you haven't been here this evening, you're lost. You know the Bible says in verse number 22, that Bible speaks about who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. That Bible says that you and I, Christ, died for us. Died for our sins, not his own. He did not do no sin, but he died for us. If you're not saved, you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's bow for prayer.